What if you knew for certain that today was the day Jesus was going to return? Would that make you feel excited, worried, nervous, scared, maybe even unprepared? How would your priorities change and what would you be doing differently? Luckily, we don't have to figure this out on our own. There actually is a parable that Jesus tells in order to help us prepare for his inevitable return. And if you stick around till the end of this episode, I'll give you four things to be thinking about that will help you be ready whenever that coming might be. This book will change your life. You just got to read it. Hi, I'm Jared Bullman, and this is Biblically Speaking. We like to say that if you give us 20 minutes, we'll help you understand the Bible. Today, we're talking about the return of Jesus, specifically one parable that he tells in order to help us be ready for that return. The text we're going to look at today comes in Matthew 25, and that's right on the heels of the discussion he was having with his disciples in chapter 24 about the destruction of the temple and how they would know when it was time for him to return. And if you haven't watched that video, I've got a card for it right over here. You can check that out a little bit later. Matthew 25, 14, he gets a little more specific with the lessons that he's teaching there from a general statement of you need to be ready to what is it that he is expecting. And he begins this section by telling the parable of the talent. You probably know this parable. You might have heard it called the parable of the men and their talents or the parable of the talents. There's lots of different names for it. But it's the story that he weaves of a man that goes on a journey and calls three of his trusted stewards into him in order for them to take his possessions and to increase his wealth. It begins in verse 14 like this. It is like a man who went on a journey. Now, the it is immediately throws us back to the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins at the beginning of the chapter where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like. So what we know from this is if you're going to be part of God's kingdom, this is a parable you need to take to heart. First thing he tells us in this parable is that this man has gone on a journey. It's obviously alluding to the time after his ascension and before his return. And the stewards in the parable or the slaves or the servants, depending on what your translation reads, would be those who are part of his kingdom presently who have work to do to one of them he gave five talents, to one of them he gave two talents, and to one of them he gave one talent. We might be picturing talents as a few coins, but really a talent was about 75 pounds of some precious metal. So if it helps you visualize it, to one guy he gave 375 pounds of gold, to another he gave 150 pounds of gold, and to the third he gave 75 pounds of gold. But what we see, if we've already identified the man going away and soon to return as Jesus, and we've already identified the stewards as those that are working in his kingdom presently, then the first question we should ask is, what are the talents that he's giving them? And I would say that the talents here we have to look at as any opportunity or any ability that Jesus has given us to serve both God and man. Because the very next parable of the judgment scene is all about how serving God is not really keeping just a list of do's and don'ts, but it is serving those who are part of God's kingdom. He gives to one five talents. It's that, you can think of that as five opportunities. You can think of that as a lot of time, a lot of wealth resources, a lot of things that he can do within the kingdom. To the other, he gives two. To another, he gives one. And he's distributing these talents based on their abilities. And what that tells us is the master who's giving them these talents knows them and understands them and knows what they are capable of. He's just looking to see them be faithful in what's expected. Now, before we leave this section, I want to point out that the two-talent man is not expected to be the five-talent man, nor is the one-talent man expected to be the two-talent man. But the five-talent man can't get by with a two-talent man's effort either. Uh, it's a lot like he says in Luke chapter 12 that the one to whom much is given, much is expected. So if we're thinking about our preparing for the judgment, we need to stop and have an honest conversation with ourselves about what opportunities is Jesus giving us? What resources is Jesus giving us? How am I using them to glorify God and bring others to him? Where the parable really turns is after the master leaves. We see a very different reaction between the three stewards, that two of them, 
the five and the two talent man go to the market. They begin to trade in the marketplace. The five talent man, through his effort, through his labor, through using what belongs to his master, that's an important perspective that what we have in this life belongs to our master. Whether we're talking about our family, our time, our resources, all of these things, they belong to Jesus. We're just using them for his glory that he goes and he uses what belongs to his master to double that. He goes from five to 10. Two talent man, same thing, same perspective. My master trusts me. He's given me this. I know I can do what he expects me to do with this. So I'm going to go to the market. I'm going to buy and sell. And he ends up getting two more. So now the five talent man is a 10 talent man. And the two talent man is a four talent man. The one talent man, however, takes a different perspective, that he goes, he digs a hole, and he hides what belongs to his master. And that's where everything remains until the day the master comes. Now, this is the part that I actually want to go to the text and read. Beginning in verse 19, the text says, Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours." But his master answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But for the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now in a moment, we're going to talk a little more specifically about the interaction between that last steward or slave or servant and his master, but I want you to see something very specific about this particular servant. He knew what was expected of him, he just didn't do it. And maybe that's one of the big keys to sort of unlocking this idea of being prepared for Jesus and his return. The five-talent man knew what was expected. He's going to go and do because he wants to please his master. He wants to be a ten-talent man. The two-talent man, same thing. He knew what was expected. He wants to become a four-talent man because his master has trusted him with that. The one-talent man is comfortable with just what Jesus has given him. He wants to just be a one-talent man. He's not interested in the kingdom growing. He's not interested in bringing glory to his master. He is not interested in becoming, showing him Himself faithful so that he can be responsible and prove his master's glory again and again and again. He just wants to show up. And that mentality may be the biggest hurdle that you and I face when it comes to our faith and trying to live as Christians in this present world. We want to be Christians, but we don't necessarily want to do the work of the Christian. Now, the one-talent man seems to think he's being shrewd. Hey, I've sort of hedged my bet. I didn't lose what the master gave me, and he can't be displeased with that. But in that, we really see the difference between good and faithful and wicked and lazy. It's not a matter of holding on and not losing what Jesus has given us. 
He has the expectation that we're going to go and do good in his name that's going to get gain from him. And we can talk in another episode about what that gain looks like. But I promised you four things that we could think about every day that would help us be better in this walk. And the first one is we got to take stock of what Jesus has given us and who this belongs to. You see, the one talent man knew that it belonged to his master. He said, here, I'm giving you back what's yours. But he doesn't act like it belongs to his master. He comes to the conclusion that he can do with his talent, with that large sum of precious metal, anything he wants to do with it including ignore his master's instructions. We need to be careful with that. When we think about the blessings that Jesus has poured into our life so that God is glorified the way he talked about in Matthew chapter 5, when we ignore those, then we're really behaving like that one talent man. The second thing that we need to think about is we need to be make sure that we are focusing on the increase, not just who it belongs to, but I need to be looking for moments where I can intentionally grow the kingdom of God. How can I use this opportunity set in front of me to do good to lead somebody else to Jesus? How can I use this moment with my family to make their faith stronger? How can I use my time, my money, my resources, my ability to go and do the strength of my hands to somehow affect in some small way the way that another person sees Jesus and maybe open a door by that that I can share the gospel with them. The third thing, and this really gets back to the story that we need to make sure that we're working on every day, is fixing our attitude about Jesus. You know what's interesting about the idea of the slave or the steward or the servant? In the first century, there are many times when the slave wanted just to become a part of the master's family. It's not the way we typically think of slavery in in American civilization, that slaves or stewards or servants really became like part of the family. That's why he says, enter into the joy of your Lord. I've got a lot more. You've shown me how faithful you are. I've got a lot more I want to make you faithful over. And that was something that the servant or the steward really wanted to hear because that meant he was being drawn closer to his master. He really was part of that family, and that was something that he would take joy in. But how does the one talent man think about his master? He says, you're a hard man. You reap where you do not sow. You gather where you haven't scattered seed. So what he is saying is that I'm looking at my life and I don't think you're fair. Maybe it's the difficulty in our life presently. Maybe we look at the people who do seem to have the five talents and the two talents and we see what God has given them and we think, well, why hasn't he given me some of that? And it becomes the jealousy over the talent of other people or over the blessings of other people that keep us from using the blessings of God that if we were more effective in them, he might bless us with more that we could thereby go and use for his glory and in the service of his kingdom. But the servant's attitude toward his master was, this is a pointless effort. I already know how this is going to end. You're a hard man, so I'm not going to risk it. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, and this is a passage of reassurance right after he tells them, that I'm going to prepare a place for you and I am the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the Father except by me. He began that whole section by saying, believe in God, believe also in me. He tells him in verse 15 that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That our obedience in this stewardship of what he has given us is an expression of our love to him. Why do I obey Jesus? Because I love him. Why do I try to seize the kingdom opportunities he's put in front of me? Because I love him. Why do I try to avoid grumbling and complaining about not having or or having too much expected of me? Because I love him. And that's what was missing in the mind of this particular one talent man was he didn't have the right perspective on his master. Don't you think the five and the two talent man knew the reputation of their master? But they still loved him. They still wanted to enter into his joy. Now, the fourth thing I would suggest is that we need to prioritize our own spiritual growth. That's where the five-talent man and the two-talent man succeeded. The five-talent man doesn't stay a five-talent man. He becomes a ten-talent man. The two-talent man doesn't stay a two-talent man. He becomes a four-talent man. 
And so much has the five talent man grown at the end of the parable that the master is giving him a little more to to grow him even further. And I have no doubt that the 11 talent man at the end of this parable is going to be a 22 talent man before very long because that's what people who appreciate their savior and what he has given them, that's how they behave. Now that we couldn't end this without looking at kind of a bonus fifth point. And that is Jesus very mercifully gives us a look at the contrast between the fates of the five and the two and the one talent man. The five and the two talent man are told to enter into the joy of their Lord. He's got a lot more prepared for them. He's got a lot more for them to do. They're excited about that. The one talent man, is he wanted to stay a one talent man, but he's thrown out. He says, go out into the darkness where there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. There's no joy for the one talent man. I promise you, if we focus on those four things, who these belong to, giving him the increase, changing our attitude, and prioritizing our own spiritual growth, we're going to be a lot more prepared for his coming than we would otherwise. Well... I hope you'll click on this video right over here. It's the introduction to this in Matthew 24. Be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and share. And leave in the comments, what are you working on spiritually that maybe another video on could help? So tell me what you're thinking about. Until I see you next time, have a good day, and God bless.